Okay. Hi, so uh, yeah, um, I guess we, what we wanna do here is um, Points of Attack came out about, about two months ago from Clash and uh, we're just looking to sort of see now that it's been read a little bit by a few people to see sort of reactions and responses, particularly from some of the people I've gathered here, uh, Jeff Wood uh, and well as Nick Rombies. You know, Jeff's a, a, an actor and an artist. Uh, Nick is a film theorist. Um, and novelist as well, uh, amongst other things. And uh, we just wanted, we've basically chosen three pieces from the book and we're going to um, each sort of read one and just sort of in a sort of dialectical way, just go from there and see what happens. So uh, um, first, before we start, why don't you each introduce yourself? So you go first, Mark. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm the author of Points of Attack. I um, am a fiction editor at 3 a.m. And uh, uh, I have a novel coming later from Clash as well called The Logos at the end of the year. And my prior novel is Square Wave from 2016. And uh, Nick Rom Rombus, am I yeah. right? Hi everybody. Um, I'm based in uh, Detroit, Michigan. And I know um, Jeff and Mark, we all publish novels around the same time from $2 Radio in Columbus, Ohio. Ohio, and um, also have work a lot with 3AM Magazine and um, teaching this semester. But this is a really nice chance to uh, just to be with some like-minded people to talk through kind of in a really unscripted way um, some of the ideas that are circulating through Mark's book. So glad to be here. Awesome. Happy to have you. Um, and uh, Jeff Wood. Jeff yeah, Wood from um, Berlin, everybody. Yeah. yeah. I'm here in Berlin um, at midnight, and uh, as these guys mentioned, I'm, a, I'm a, an actor and a writer um, working across different disciplines um, in literature and theater and um, um, dance theater and experimental film and video. And um, yeah, had, had, a, had a book come out in proximity to these gentlemen with $2 Radio, and we've all done a bit of work together at 3 a.m. Magazine. And so it's uh, really nice to see everybody from here in Berlin. So this is basically an ad for $2 Radio and 3 a.m. Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's okay. kick things off. Okay, um, great. I, I thought I'd read a piece called Taboos. Yeah. Um, uh, where there are pieties, and they are everywhere, even in the ostensibly secular realms of society, there will be taboos. I still recall the baffled rage of the cosmopolitan intelligentsia that met the release a decade ago now of Jerry Fodor and Massimo Piatelli Palomarini's What Darn Got Wrong, a treatise that asked pointed questions concerning the soundness of evolutionary explanation specifically the appeal to a mechanism of natural selection. The book's conclusions and premises may well be flawed, but there's nothing special in that. Thousands of wrongheaded books are released every year. The reaction, however, even in rarefied intellectual circles, including the New York Review of Books, was far more scornful, even contemptuous, than this garden variety intellectual shortcoming can reasonably merit given that the book was patently put forth in good faith by two venerable thinkers. Thomas Nagel's Mind and Cosmos released two years later and also defending the notion that a Darwinian view of nature has its limitations, was derided and denounced rather than simply demurred at, a sure sign that, that respectfully questioning the explanatory power of evolution counts in our era as a kind of blasphemy. Now, more even-handed rebuttals to these books did eventually come, of course, but it is that initial tsunami of reactive hostility among the intellectual classes, trained as they are to resist snap ju judgments, that bears remembering. What is properly taboo is never self-evidently or seriously unethical. It would be bizarre to describe rape or genocide as taboo. Rather, taboos are tainted by persistent suspicions of a wrongness that is not easily demonstrable. Habitual drug use and promiscuity are two that still hang on in polite society, though they have lost much of their power elsewhere. Others more closely comparable to the one with which we started include research into the genetics of intelligence, 
an area that is not intrinsically problematic. I mean, genes play some role in structuring cre uh, all creatures' lives, yet tends to raise suspicions concerning motives, not always wrongly either. Taboos exist in moral gray zones, places where our disapproval of a practice isn't matched by an argument against it that we ourselves regard as self-evidently true, much less others. Hence our need in shunning the practice to press our hostile emotions into service. A genuinely secular society, it seems, would concern itself only with the most basic or vital ethical matters while excising its pieties and taboos, which are nebulous in comparison. Clearly, we don't live in such a society, yet one can take this conclusion in different ways. There are those who clamor for a social world liberated from taboo, one that countenances only rights violations and legal codes. But there are others. Might taboo and piety be features of the religious impulse not to be overcome, even for those who have no interest in upholding any particular religious tradition? Taboos express communal commitments that are, aren't essential to the very possibility of a stable society in the way that prohibition on random murder is, for example. Hence, they may not admit of knockdown arguments. Instead, in these realms, it may be affect and disposition that guide us, however uncertainly, rather than reason. A community that failed to be bound by these sorts of penumbral norms would not feel like much of a community at all, only a formal arrangement between strangers concerning fundamental rights. Yet the scope of ethics is greater than the scope of bare law. And it is in just this space where custom and taboo hold greatest sway. It is also where we test our imaginations against the bulwark of tradition. This finally is the appeal of taboo. And it is why so much productive iconoclasm is predicated on its exploration. Without taboo, a certain kind of creative pressure dissipates from which one can only expect a slackening of culture. Very good. Um, I guess I'll go first. Sure. Shall I? Sure. Um, this, this chapter really struck me as being emblematic, emblematic of the way the, the book functions as a whole. And, um, and by that I mean um, as really uh, an encounter and an engagement with the world that we're in right now. Um, and, and this is something that I found to be more and more satisfying as I, as I went through the book um, in its sort of um, gentle ambition to bring some equilibrium to the very, very disorienting circumstances that we find ourselves in. Um, and um, some some equilibrium via uncertainty right. rather than through certainty. And the, the sort of binary um, forces that are pushing us toward certainty all the time in reactionary response to the uncertainty that we find ourselves in. And um, I dove into the book and hit this chapter um, just a few days after January 6th, after the Capitol riots. And um, something really struck me about the chapter um, as really speaking to the moment and really speaking to my own deep uncertainty about not only what was happening, but how it was happening, how I was perceiving it to happen how I was perceiving it to happen with everyone else who was perceiving it to happen, really in the very mode that we're engaging with each other right now, to the extent that what was happening was um, not even really sure how to understand what it was that was, what we're seeing, in the right. sense that we're not even sure what it is we're watching. And, um, um, in the sense that uh, it was so unbelievable that the, the, it was, the only thing unbelievable about it was that it was actually happening because it had been telegraphed so clearly right. for so long that the only thing unbelievable about this totally unbelievable event is that it's actually happening. 
And of course, what erupted immediately or, or what transpired soon after was the deplatforming of the president of the United States, not an insignificant event, immediately leading to this incendiary debate over censorship and free speech. Right. Uh, aside from all the, the big tech discussions and, and the politics of it all, what really struck me very immediately and, and quite deeply from, from isolation in Berlin with this internet machine is, um, is, uh, is the notion that what we were seeing was taboo, really bursting through the screen like spiders. And, um, and uh, or, or what we might otherwise characterize as a sort of 3D live animation of mental illness. And um, uh, I, this is all sort of side commentary. What the, or, or, or explanation of why the chapter touched me in the way that it did. Um, which, which is that um, the categories of, censor of, of censorship and, spree and free speech were, I think it's an understatement to say, um, really radically insufficient for accounting for the um, dilemma that we were being presented with and really insufficient at being um, able to grapple with the, the circumstances of our of our context here. In, in the sense that it, it was being argued about in, in too mechanical a way, sort of, in terms of a, sort of a presentation of a, a basic right that has to be upheld absolutely across the board versus something a little bit more shadowy, which we, we often think, for, you know, in the same way that, uh, you know, as I believe in our, some of our personal exchanges, the, the, the way that, you know, almost all legal language has these reasonableness clauses built in precisely to give space for human judgment of a sense of like, in this context, does it make sense to allow such and such a thing? Does, does this count as incitement to violence or does, in the terms of speech, it, does his speech generally upon Twitter count as a certain incitement? I, I think so. And I think, yeah. I think even sort of prior, prior to that, um, yeah. it dawned on me rather surprisingly, sort of in the crisis of the moment, which was actually a personal crisis of perception, I think for everyone, yeah. as much as it was a political crisis or right. a crisis of, of law or, um, but uh, to the extent that it, what dawned on me rather surprisingly was that the, it is the very limitations of speech itself which render it meaningful and render it usable and in fact render it human. And so what we were witnessing was sort of absolutely on the one hand, on one end of the circuit was absolutely unlimited speech to the degree that it was rendered inhuman. And at the other end of the circuit, speech that was already being so highly regulated by an inhuman apparatus, right. it, renders, it renders the users of that speech already inhuman upon the execution of it. Right. I mean, so much of his, his presidency, I think, was characterized by this quality of, you know, there are all these unwritten rules about an administration, about presidential conduct, and in almost all these cases, right, he, he was essentially saying, well, there's, you know, they're unwritten. As long as they're unwritten, I'm, I'm going to push them to the limit in that way. And there was, and in a sense, our sense of norms, our norms that are transcend strict law, but go down to custom, right? Customs of administration, of handovers of power, all sorts of things that throughout the time he was in office of, of appointment of um, whether it's judges or other, other senior officials. He seemed to violate all the customs in that way, and, and only all the mechanism we had left was this sort of strict, bare bones sort of legal code to contain him. And that proved in many, many ways just highly, highly in, uh, insufficient uh, and, and unable to contain him in the moment. And the damage that is obviously going to be, you know, we'll be dealing with for a long time. Yeah, hey, I find that fascinating myself because. You know, it's funny, one of the things that he got his followers very excited about, you know, saying stuff like, I'm going to drain the swamp, I'm going to, you know, I'm different, I'm not a politician. And, you know, he was totally honest. He, he reminds me a lot of, like, Tony Montana, how he said, like, he, what did he say? He's like, I, I always tell the truth, 
even right. when I lie. <laughs> right, 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 right. I feel like that sums up Trump because it's like, he is what he is, you know? Yeah. And you know what he is and he's not, he's like, yeah, I'm a piece of shit, you know? Yeah. I, I want what I want, I get what I want. And, you know, I'm gonna go around making deals and try to make deals that benefit me. So the people that were inspired by him were like, yeah, he's not gonna take any shit. He's nobody can manipulate him. I mean, little did they right. know about Putin and all that, but um, you know, they're like, he's gonna, and, and he kind of did what he said he was gonna do. He said he was gonna break the whole thing. I mean, I wonder sometimes if that was his whole goal was just, I just wanna break the government. Like, right. I mean, he pretty much, he's pretty much destroyed the Republican party. Like, honestly, he's done a lot of damage in a lot of ways, especially the mishandling of the coronavirus uh, treatment. But um, that is really his lasting um, uh, work, is he right. has completely fractured the Republican Party. Because now everybody in the party has to decide, am I in the Trump Republican Party, which is the cult of Trump, or am I in like the other party that's not the cult of Trump? Yeah, yeah, and that's yeah. splitting it. That's splitting it in half. I don't no, know this is the... This, this is the uncanny quality of language itself and, and speech itself as the, as the sort of merger of language and voice that I think your chapter touches on the, in, in the sense that the genie is out of the bottle there in terms of what you're saying, Lisa. That, um, and the, 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 the cool way that your book works, Mark, also that I'm finding is, is how these texts are all interrelated as you move through it and start sort of feeding back on each other. In another chapter, of your book, The Language of Experience, um, you say that words can represent almost anything that might happen to us, but what they can't do is replicate experiences. And what I was thinking that I would add to this discussion about taboos yeah. is they can't replicate experiences, but what they can do, we've found, whether it's in um, a great novel or effective propaganda or these accumulating networks of congregations of tribes is that they can't replicate experience, but they can generate it. Right. Uh, and um, when we put that in the context of the uh, events that have just recently transpired, um, to sort of put it in a more sinister light, I would say like by the inverse logic of Citizens United, the president of the United States on Twitter is very literally not an individual human being at all, but, but right. is an inhuman uh, reality generating weapon. And um, Reality is in the eye of the beholder. People wanted a reality star and they got it. And I also think going back to what you were saying, Lisa, about the taboos and Trump breaking them, that he made us all feel or some people will feel like fools for following and, you know, calling people names, nicknames, the awful language that he used, the demeaning, the dehumanizing language, which was taboo for the president of the United States, yes. leader of the free world, to use those so casually to unloosen them from the realm of taboo uh, and to circulate them in kind of the network of our discourse is if you've been foolish all your lives and not using the, the, this language, right. quickly shifting the terrain of what is taboo and in, in, in what is not. And I think that also gets back to what Jeff was saying about we need limitations to make language meaningful. And part of this debasement of language under the Trump administration is in the disattachment of meaning from their, obviously meaning from their words uh, and the lifting of those limitations which are sort of taboo. I think also when I was reading the chapter, I, I thought a lot about it in terms of kind of art and creativity and the need for taboo and restraint and limitation, not only on political discourse, but also um, in, for, the, for the act of creating. And so I was really fascinated. And I think also part of this speaks, Mark, to um, when, you know, and Jeff, I think mentioned this at the very beginning of your response, something about your language, the beauty of your language. And I have really hard times with books that have great ideas, but the language is fairly flat or plain, or language is really beautiful and flowery, but the ideas are flat and plain. And for me, the sweet spot, which your book is, is a confluence of 
both idea and the poetic expression of those ideas. Part of that for me, it just as you were reading um, the, the, the chapter on taboos, I would say if I like, I was trying to think about why is that? Like, what is it? If you really burrow down into <clears throat> how do you achieve that sweet spot? I think all writers, all creators do it differently. One of the things I noticed in the reading is you have this very nice rhythm of balancing of um, kind of longer and shorter sentences that create some musicality. And when you were reading so early on in Taboos, you have uh, the book's conclusions and premises may well be flawed, but there is nothing special in that. And that's coming after a few longer sentences. And then uh, thousands of wrongheaded books are released every year, short. And I love that. I love you have these kind of short sentences. It's very aphoristic. Yeah. So I just wanted to comment on part of the pleasure of the book is the securing of the ideas in my brain through something that transcends the ideas themselves. But in the part of the argument is in the writing of the book itself. I, I think that's right. I, 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 anyways, I'd hoped that would sort of come through that the actual manner of, of putting these things would have something to do with their um, intellectual power or, uh, you know, fertility is partly, I think, in, in those rhythms and things that I read and enjoy as well. I often think that much of the power of uh, work that isn't sort of been drained of all its life in a sort of standard, you know, kind of journal article, academic form, or that sort of thing that sort of bled dry, that, that it still has life in it is part of its intellectual import, not just its sort of aesthetic import is carried by rhythm and tone. And so aesthetics almost has its cognitive component. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to, I think, maybe highlight that in some way here, that that, that is the thinking. The thinking is the, the rhythm and, and these sorts of ways of, of, of phrasing and shaping a thought and sort of sculpting a line. So, so. And I wonder if you're, if the short aphoristic, uh, you know, these of these short entries also speaks to, I wonder, you know, the need to create our own constraints as writers, as creators. Um, obviously, there's lots of examples of that in the creative world. I think a lot of, you know, the Dogma 95 movement that right. there are no taboos anymore in the making of film. I don't know if there's any taboos anymore in writing. Uh, for good or for, you know, yeah. Havel talks about, you know, living in a post-God world, post-1960s, when, you know, everything is permitted. And I find it fascinating when we bring those limits back, the limits of language that Jeff was talking about, right. back onto ourselves through creating our own artificial taboos, which, yeah. don't, which don't necessarily emerge from the folk or from the ground up, but emerge from an aesthetic community. Um, and I found that I felt that you had harnessed some of the taboo of I'm not going to have a chapter that's 30 pages. <laughs> right. Yeah, taboo, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. generate something creative. Absolutely. There were points where I thought, well, you know, what would what would be the normal thing to do here would be to tidy this in a certain way or to to make, you know, the, these lines converge in a certain way. And I thought, you know, in some way that would betray that the actual, as I say, that the, the cognitive component of, of what's going on. So I, I agree that there there are ways in which, uh, you know, I avoided my I have I mean, being trained in philosophy, I have a natural tendency towards, say, system and uh, theory and principle. So for me personally, it certainly was a way of pushing against maybe instincts towards sort of theory building and uh, construction and, and sort of staying at the ground level and seeing what the view is like from there and uh, what, how much intellectual activity as it were could go on at the ground level. And it, I think it turns out uh, quite a lot. You know, you, 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 you don't necessarily always need the apparatus of a, of a kind of totalizing, you know, theoretical structure, so. No, I found it very gentle. And this is <laughs> really, it's, it's very gentle. Su su surprised me and was very refreshing to, to have this sort of, even within the uh, sort of strict structure of the, which is very difficult to achieve this brevity, very difficult to achieve this kind of brevity. And within that sort of rather um, austere structure to have this sort of gentle handling of uncertainties. Mm -hmm. um, and this was really, really, really nice. There's something about the structure of the book, the way all these chapters are arranged, um, which the chapter titles themselves are sort of like this um, catalog index of engagements with contemporary, contemporary reality. 
right. uh, uh, contemporary experience. And um, there's something, um, it's kind of a, um, a, a, tired, a tired comparison or a very common comparison, um, but it, uh, the organization of the book reminded me of, of Invisible Cities. Um, yeah. Um, where, where a single city is being described from an infinite number of vantage points. And in this case, um, you're not describing the city, you're describing all the possible vantage points from which to view the invisible right. city. And um, not to overstate the, the, the comparison, but I found this really, really elegant and, and fragile, as you said before. So I think that brings us back to the book. Uh, well, I mean, we're talking about the book, but it's a good breaking point to move on to the next essay. Um, so we're gonna do Resignation's Resurgence. Nicholas Rumbliss is gonna talk about it. Okay, great, I will read this. Bastardized versions of Greek Stoicism and Zen Buddhism have come into fashion with technology entrepreneurs and other urban elites over the past half decade, and the timing makes good sense. The appeal of any philosophy of detachment surges in unruly eras, when the world seems so completely to resist our efforts to reform it. That is one way of seeing the matter, the preferred way, in fact. Climate change, the concentration of capital, ideological polarization, energy shortages, indiscriminate violence against innocence, radical populism. It is hard to feel anything but defeated by the scope of these issues. Yet it is equally difficult not to feel implicated in the mess. All the more so for the Silicon Valley businessmen who have starred in the dramatic crises of our moment. For an industry weaned on the vanities of utopianism and led by corporations with slogans like, don't be evil, assuaging guilt is a crucial mission. And there is no better way to do it short of actually not being evil, than adopting a stance of quiet resignation toward the world's fate, as if they had no hand in it, and merely disciplining their emotional reactions rather than their destructive actions. In this way, they conveniently, they conveniently divorce their personal welfare, and they are faring very well indeed, from the welfare of the world at large. Stoicism and Buddhism both fit the bill in promoting attitudes of equanimity, come what may, and accepting suffering as inevitable. But they also counsel personally comporting oneself in an ethically defensible way to it, refraining to the greatest extent possible from adding to the miseries of the world. Here is where the shell games begin. We should not mistake the growing silence of businessmen on the redemptive powers of digital technology for a newfound inward looking spirituality. The utopianism, a quarter century later, looks deluded or self-serving or both. That is the reason for the retreat into silence. Nor should we conflate the purely self-involving changes they make to their way of life, adopting meditation, rigorous outdoor activity, fishing, sorry, fasting. <laughs> 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 with the full range of change required by either philosophy. Other involving changes, altering one's professional activities, if they have damaging consequences for the wider world, for one, must also be made. But it is precisely these that they will not countenance, which leaves their philosophical commitments a farce. Well, there's a tourism there at work isn't there mm. uh, a sort of uh neurological tourism in the in the cognitive dissonance that you're pointing out mark and there's certainly an entire cultural economy thriving around the palliative care for the trauma of uh, disaster capitalism so there's obviously an enormous amount of human capital to be exploited by amplifying the trauma cinema of the society rather than addressing the underlying conditions. And in that, it makes sense that tech and cultural leaders would practice what they preach by emphasizing detachment from causes 
and drawing attention to maintaining a nervous system which can continue to use and be used by the apparatus, you know, which uh, requires a certain kind of lubricant in order to render uh, what would other bo otherwise be a, a toxic reality, um, non-toxic and, and keep us native to it. You know, it's the sort of goop, the goop lube. And, um, and to, 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 to uh, you know, reconstruct a social problem as a, as a personal problem, as it were, you know, something to be relieved by uh, inner disciplining of the mind or through various other sorts of accoutrements of the sort of wellness culture, et cetera. That there is that, I think, pull uh, uh, to not seeing like, wait, in the first instance, you know, what about, the, as you say, what about the cause of this? Isn't, isn't that addressable? And moreover, isn't that a key component of some of the sort of religious traditions that are being drawn on uh, and philosophical traditions that are being drawn on here? I mean, in both cases, Stoicism and, and Buddhism, there, there is a strong element in both of a normative component that, um, say, for, for Stoics, that, you know, living in agreement with nature, you know, is one of the formulations. I think that's uh, Cleanthes um, and... Uh, Okay, so one thinks, well, living in agreement with nature, well, well, with whatever, as it were, what with what happens. But of course, what's added to this is the idea that, well, part of our nature is a, a rational and normative nature as human beings. And part of that involves care for one another at the ethical level, which is a type of perspective that is specially available to, to creatures with, you know, cognitive abilities of our kind and other social abilities of our kind. So in other words, ethics doesn't go away because you start talking about, well, this is natural, this is the way of the world. Part of the way of the world is our special capacities to be moral, to, to not do the bad thing, the thing that is, is creating suffering or misery for others. Um, or ourselves in, in a way, that these things are not natural in that way and that uh, they can be fought off in those ways. So I think there's, there's a kind of way in which we, this, this fatalism is, is sort of endorsed in a certain way and intending, intending to your own wounds is, is proffered as the solution when it's really the, both of these traditions have much more rich normative resources to offer um, deeper solutions than merely sort of uh, palliative care, as you put it, uh, Jeff, which I think is exactly right. And I also think it's kind of an interesting kind of reflection. I, I get the whiff of the 60s and the boomers. Yeah. And I know the do no evil uh, quote, it comes from a younger person at Google, but it's predicated on Steve Jobs, I think, and the right. entire sandals, you know, the, the, what's left, you know, the, the shadow structures of the 60s here are the narcissism, the inward looking, the social problems atomized down to personal self-help of course, the whole California coast I yeah. mean, it's kind of that whole ideology that is, you know, the, the legacy of, of, of the 60s in terms of kind of the, these, you know, these platitudes that right. are from, I think, that the boomers sort of invented to uh, reframe the failures. Right, the right. Movement. And so much of Silicon Valley is imbued, even by people who are not boomers, whether they know it or not, with that, um, with the hollow, with the hollowed out worst part of the 60s. Right. Um, and it's a kind of recapitulation of prior uh, solutions, so to speak, to these, these, these mm -hmm. dilemmas. Right. Mm hmm. Mm. Kara has a really interesting I also point I also in the chat. No, no, I was just, if I could read Kara, uh, ahead, yeah. Angela Davis yeah. refusing to accept the things she cannot change comes to mind in contradistinction to tech quote detachment. Right. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's just so interesting that you heard so much of that utopianism in around 2000 and you don't hear those speeches being given anymore, that kind of optimism. Most of these people are in hiding for the most part or have some kind of deranged public persona like Elon Musk. They, it no longer looks exciting or tantalizing or desirable. It's like our Gwyneth Paltrow with her goop stuff. All, all of this looks, I mean, it looks, it looks very frightening, really. <laughs> I, I want to get that. I want to smell that vagina candle, but I don't want to pay for it. <laughs>
I really want to smell it though. I'm so curious. That's right. <laughs> well, there's, and there's a dimension, there's a dimension to all of this that, um, that, that, that sort of apparatus, as I'm calling it, that, that you're referring to there um, is the nervous system of the cultural economy uh, at, the, at the expense of society mm-hmm. and, or, or sort of as an imposter society. And, um, and uh, that, that, nervous, that nervous system um, is at the expense of our own nervous systems. So it, <laughs> right. it, it honestly, and to our benefit, and we're not going to say there's not, a, not any benefit to it, exactly. but, um, but at, at cost to our own nervous systems, both positive cost and negative cost, to the degree that um, it forces that position of sort of atomizing yourself within your own process of cleansing your own nervous system enough to keep using the social apparatus of it um, in place of more um, what I want to sort of um, um, uh, arcanely call human interaction. I mean, we're all having human interaction right now to the best of our ability, um, but um, the Twitter ecosystem is, uh, is a nervous system and thought apparatus that absolutely thrives on, on um, trauma. Definitely. And, it's, and, it's very, and it's very sort of atomic interaction with, with us. Um, I've noticed that when I'm not like in a zone to like do good tweets, but when I'm depressed or sexually frustrated or just feeling really bad that's when i or i'm having like a manic episode that's when my tweets are the best right so. and they're mo- most well received as well yeah. i take it. yeah right yeah 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 because everybody just wants to like bitch about stuff i mean facebook right. is the same except it's it's more like boring bitching like oh yeah. man, i gotta shovel my driveway like like wow great story <laughs> glad i tuned in for this one <laughs> yeah i mean I'll, I'll use myself as an example just because it's a, gl- a sort of glaring example that i'm here in berlin in lockdown yeah. um the the my my intimate connection to the united states now which i care very deeply about um for better and worse, uh, is in some ways is Twitter, you know? And if it's not Twitter, it's this series of essays or this series of commentary or, or this um, Instagram feed from friends and family that mean a great deal to me and that I actually value these uh, technologies for. Um, but there's a... Uh, it's it's good, right? There, there must be, as you, as you point out, there's a, there's an appealing side to these things. So absolutely, why absolutely. don't you? Maybe you could say a bit more about that side because obviously we wouldn't be involved in these things in quite this way if there wasn't. You right. Know, a, a I draw. mean, it connects us. I mean, that's yeah. Amazing. Totally. It is. It is like the internet is the the power hack. You know, you think about yeah. times when you know only wealthy people could transport themselves and it still would take forever like communication now everybody can communicate i mean if you have a phone you can communicate you know and everywhere all over the world we're not divided by by space or by class or by anything but what's interesting to me is that now that we have this freedom you know it just seems like we're like monkeys with a tool we don't know how to use yet and we're just going to our basest in instincts of like, oh, let's have a witch hunt again th- against this person yeah. or let's all dwell on this depressing shit. Like, yeah. you know, instead of like, hey, let's see what we all have in common. You know, like that's why yeah. I don't post like what I actually believe. Like I'm not gonna use the internet to discuss it. You know? <laughs> that's interesting. Like, okay, yeah. You know, I would... also that. No, <laughs> go ahead. Um, 
you know, like I would talk about magic and stuff. Like I believe in magic. A lot of people who are very, I'm friends with a lot of intellectuals, you know, I'm publishing and talking to three intellectuals right now, you know, um, whatever. It would just get annoying possibly, or maybe not, but I just don't feel like that's what it's for. You know, I want it. I want to use it to see what do we have in common, you know, not let's find every single way that we disagree. Like right. if you keep talking with somebody, no matter how much stuff you have in common, you're eventually going to find plenty of stuff that you just completely disagree on and you cannot comprehend how this person feels this way and you think they're insane or just have really bad taste. Like it could be a band you don't disagree, you, you know? Right. It's just like a waste of time. But I sometimes wonder how many persona can we take on and survive? And that's that schizophrenic nature I find of social media, which is, you know, I can barely survive with, you know, I'm a child of the 70s. I was born in 1965. So my whole experiences growing up were pre-internet, pre-digital. And I felt struggling. I, I, I struggled with the persona I had. The persona is the good student. <laughs> the persona is the son. Then the persona to the father of my children. The persona as a scholar as I became. The persona as the professor for my students. And and now I find, uh, you know, on, on, tw on Twitter and Instagram and, and this everywhere that I find that the burdens of my persona, which gets back, I think, to what you were saying, Lisa, about you don't post who you, what you really believe or what you are, then this gets into this question of authenticity. Well, then who, who am I really, right? Am I the jerk that posted that thing that I regret when I had been drinking too much on a Friday night? Is that the real me? I don't know. It, they're all which parts of you. They're all, part, right. they're all fragments. But the problem with social media is it encourages mm. informativeness. So, mm. you know, especially people that are like, you guys don't have to deal with it as much. You know, you're actually valued for your intelligence since you're men. You know, that helps a lot. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you're, if you're like a female writer, your brand has a lot to do with how you look. Right. And if you don't mm. look good, you're not going to get as many opportunities. I mean, this is not true across the board, but like it doesn't hurt. So then you're trying to see, well, how do I curate my image? But I need to look good, but not like slutty, like professional, cute or whatever. And your words, everything is judged, not just how you look, everything you say. So then you start to craft a persona, you know, and a lot of times and people that are more in the performing arts, of course, of any of any sex. And then they craft these personas and then they get trapped in these personas and they're like, this isn't me. But if, especially if you get famous, you're like, well, I guess it is now. Like, you right. know, I, I think one of the things is that the extent to which, uh, you know, these, these types of engagement, the construction of these personas, maybe not intrinsically, you know, are not necessarily harmful. It's the extent to which they chase out other activities in your life that you used to value, used to get, engage in, that may be a little bit more, you, you can't do from your bed with your phone, that are, take a little bit, maybe a little bit more effort, maybe a little bit more physical coordination with other people. It's almost lowered the bar to communication so much that maybe we don't raise ourselves up to the level of, let me actually meet that person. Let me go and organize something jointly, like a text will do it. It'll, it'll be good enough. And that, I think that's one of the dangers, the way that uh, it, if used in, in, in a sort of limited tactical way, it's, it's almost impossible not to see it as a positive, but then used in this broader way, it starts su supplanting the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. then, uh, then you end up with this sort of aftermath and you see the kind of salves offered online or elsewhere. And they always seem to be ways of keeping your addiction going though. I mean, to go back to what Jeff was saying, right? Like little solutions, not really to change your life too much, but just, uh, you know, take a break for, you know, a day and then come back and, and keep going rather than maybe think about your life a little bit more and other things you could be having going on or right. things you used to do yeah. <laughs> that are now, some, you, know, times you know, you or, or, or just, or, you know, yeah, exactly. Like, like, you know, think, you know, other possibilities that you have, you have let go or, or have been foreclosed upon by this sort of obsessive sort of dwelling around these, these sorts of, otherwise potentially, you know, positive um, 
kind of technology. It's yeah. not like the internet's the only technology of that sort. Of. A gun is also a technology of that yeah. sort, right? There, well, are, there are many of that sort. So it <laughs> was developed by the military. So right. it was originally supposed to be for military communications. Right. You know, as was ACID. So the military designs. <laughs> Behind most good things is the military. <laughs> That's about it. Just, just. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I don't get it when people are like, oh, I have to take it off my phone or whatever. Like, just don't go on. Like, exactly, you yeah. have to click on it. Every time you see a notification, you don't have to go, yeah. and say, oh, my God, who else liked my stupid dog picture? Like, yeah. you'll survive. Like, wait half an hour. Like, you right. know. Right. That the solution might right be at a slightly there. deeper level than you know, just this tiny fix or this tweak that could slow you down, something something genuinely philosophical, as it were, where these are kinds of bogus philosophies passed off as really as excuses for continuing down the path that technologies and other other things have sort of already set us in motion um, and that are, of course, filling certain people's coffers as well. So, yeah, it's I mean, I think, I think, honestly, it's very smart how you did this book, you know, for anybody that, I mean, probably everybody here has it, but if you yeah. don't, like, you know, I definitely highly recommend it, even if you're not really into philosophy. So, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I like the existentialist, but I'm not mm -hmm. like a big philosophy nerd. Yeah. But I love how it's readable and very concise. And each idea has its own section. It doesn't go on longer than it should. It's short. And like they were saying, you know, the flow of language, which matters to me a lot when I read as well. Yeah. You know, I cannot read things that are badly written. I just can't. So... Um, I think it's smart, though, how you did this, because we live in an age where we are surrounded by a myriad of distractions. Right. And like you're saying, the phone, you know, yeah. really is just an excuse to skate on the surface of reality, right? That's Nobody right. wants to actually be in their bodies and be present, because it's absolutely overwhelming. It can be incredible as well, but it can be very overwhelming so you look at your phone you look at this you wonder about some meaningless thing like it's all just helping you skate so you kind of hacked that with this right <laughs> right because it's bite-sized yeah exactly they yeah. they're gonna skate but then yeah. you know they're gonna have to dive in you know right. so i love that um should we move on to the next uh um, next one next uh F section next uh, essay mm -hmm. unread books so jeff wood's gonna read that unread books books are now published in numbers so vast that the writing of one can no longer be presumed to be an act of communication yet volumes unread or even unpublished can have their value unbound prose offers the writer a chance one one never to be encountered in conversation, no matter how patient her listeners, to comb slowly through her own mind, sorting out her thoughts and reflexively exploring her sensibilities. Along the way, catharsis too may be in the offing. Any troubling feelings discovered while writing may be discharged, if only she can figure out how, without needing to involve readers in the least. It is a pleasurable challenge simply to write at great length, not to appreciate one's own voice, but to carry off a sustained fluency ordinary life never asks of us. There's also something to be said in publishing a book for putting oneself in a position to be read, even if that reading remains notional for some or all time. Creating a potential communicative act, even if one knows not when, where, or with whom it may be fulfilled, gestures at the fundament of expression. I was thinking of a few things. I was thinking, of course, for all writers out there, we have unbound prose. I mean, it, right, it speaks to our hearts, right? All the things we've written that don't end up in the second part of what Jeff read, right? Which is yeah. published. And the fluency of thought that goes into a different kind of thought than what Lisa and we've just been talking about with public thought on Twitter or whatever, that kind of that private thought that allows for a different stream of consciousness, a different fluency, a different language, a different persona to emerge in the stuff that's whether it's published, whether it's published or not. 
and I know when I was reading this, and uh, the reason I was really attracted to this one was I, I wasn't only thinking of ourselves and all of us as writers, yeah. but also, you know, the unread books that are out there that uh, when we could go to libraries and, you know, I remember wandering around my university's library in a stack that they were getting ready to kind of get rid of the books. And what a pleasure to find, what a pleasure, a sadness too, and a sense of humanity and fragility and all the books that, you know, had not been cracked open since they had been purchased yeah. by the Jesuits back in 1918 and were unread. And um, I collect some, I, I, I pulled a few off my shelf yeah. before. I've, I've gotten lately into these um, geological surveys uh, in the United States. This one is uh, from Iowa. And these are, this is this annual report. These are wow. thick, beautifully yeah. written. You know, you just open it yeah. up and read. You know, he's gonna open it up. Um, Professor Todd further states that, quote, there was a fall of 350 feet from Sioux City to Wall Lake, but at present, the elevation of low water in Missouri River at Sioux City is 1,076 feet, while the elevation of Wall Lake is about 1,225 feet. And there's, in this, in this geological writings, there's, there's a passion, right? They're, there's, yeah. they're beautiful. I don't know who read these. Yeah. I don't know if anybody read these. Some of them come with these beautiful maps, you know, yeah. that also are likewise just gorgeously created it's also a form of publication you know these maps yeah. that are in some of these geological surveys and they're never read but to me they're the most beautiful sad things i'll crack them open and read them knowing that maybe no one except that professor whoever wrote that yeah um in his family and maybe a few colleagues read it and it's so sad and fragile and so humbling and I, the notion of unread books is still a mystery in this world something that's un, that's been created but undiscovered um, just really resonated with me in that in that section. And I, I see some of that in a in a maybe a, in a slightly more optimistic way that there are as you stroll through a library there are all these potentialities that like sort of voices beckoning as it were, and um, sometimes it's the chance encounter which is less common online than say in a bookstore for instance. But that's one of the virtues of a bookstore or even a library that the stumbling upon, as it were, into a conversation almost, as you, you know, pick something up, like, like a geological survey, um, a discovery of a, of a, of a, of a voice and, and an interest that maybe was only submerged that required a voice to call it out in you as such. So I, I kind of see it as it's a kind of potentiality that the resource that you may not actually end up exploiting and using, mm. but that having it there is, 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 is a, it, that sense of abundance can be a, a, a good feeling too, as well as I, I, I do understand what you mean by the, the tragic sense of these voices calling out with no one, as it were, hearing them. But it's unlike the human voice, right? Embodied human voice. This voice is there for, you know, an extended period. It could be, it is there to potentially be picked up depending on the library or the place it's found a hundred years down the line, 200 years down the line. So that's kind of, I, the, and the chanceness of the encounters that, you know, might occur are kind of interesting to me, so. Yeah. And since you mentioned chanceness, you know, I was thinking of going back to what I think Lisa was saying in yeah. the previous chapter, you know, the way that your book is organized, yeah. there is, it's, it's, it's not random. It's a metaphor for randomness. I mean, the, yeah. the sense that, I mean, any book is random in the sense that we could pick any spot. You can read any yeah. chapter. But I think obviously there's certain aesthetics in film and in books that encourage the the metaphoric randomness right yes the, the the ways in which we read your short chapters is there's a sense of not being controlled by the authorial voice yeah much in a linear argument philosophical text which i think also speaks to what lisa was saying in terms of the appeal for yes. you know for that which i really like it's kind of data database driven. They're each databases that can be arranged in our own reading. They're bound by your intention. They're bound by the book itself, the, the way the publishers put them together. So they're not, it's not really random, but then nothing really is. I mean, but it, it, it suggests randomness, right. which also I think is anarchic and democratic and can be very freeing and hopeful and optimistic. And, and I think even within the randomness, you, you know, by by jumping into certain books, in, including this one, at at different moments, uh, you know, you might see the streams of thought slightly differently. It's like that's the first beat, 
of what you read. And that ends up, so that ends up not being, you know, a sort of um, a side note or a background note. It ends up being more central just because of the contextual way you've happened to have gone through it. So I know people, some people have emailed me and said, you know, they've jumped in and sort of just followed their interests. And it's so interesting to see the currents that they, they picked up uh, to it that even I, I'm sometimes like, oh, that's, that is interesting, that, that little loop, because I was aware, say, of another one, another type of structure, but they're in their own way are, you know, servicing these other ones that are kind of interesting. So the book even has these sort of, uh, you know, multiple ways of, of, of yielding connections between pieces too, depending on how they're engaged, I think, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, this has been a really interesting discussion. Every, every section, I mean, we could probably have just done the whole book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it would take, uh, you know, till the marathon, yeah. 7 a.m. in uh, Berlin. Um, but yeah, this has been really cool. Um, should we open this up to the audience? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so if questions? anybody in the audience would like to ask the authors any questions, uh, this is your chance. You can go on video and ask, reveal yourself. Come on. Are there any questions? Comments? You're welcome, hecklers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Hil Hilbert makes an interesting comment here on uh, on the chapter that we yeah. just did. He says that uh, unread books are dark matter within our own aesthetic body. They have their own gravity, though they are unseen. Um, and uh, that that's that's really right. that's really beautiful. As you two, as you guys were talking, I was thinking about the. Um, I hadn't thought of it as gravity, but uh, the idea that you can take your, I mean, just the idea of a book as um, a gravitational uh, mass. In right. Which, in which you take your own um, uh, a gravitational stream of, of thought <laughs> that's rendered by language and imagine it as an object that you, to, to, whether, whether you actually publish it as, as the object, which is a sort of beautiful, uh, uh, resistance against all odds that this would become an object, you know. No, right. This becomes an object <laughs> is really a, a miracle. And yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, even if it doesn't happen, as you say in your chapter, yeah. that just to imagine that this ephemeral, in, inhuman, viral application that we I don't know, I'm in this zone where I'm dealing with my own son who's six years old and, and seeing him learn language from me even though I'm not teaching it to him. Mm. Right. And, um, to imagine that this entity can take on the quality of a gravitational mass, which is a book, um, which enters into the whole um, sort of fractal world that you make possible in your book as a category of taboos and um, restraint and limitation and um, uh, possibility and excess and um, yeah. And I also like that, just <laughs> oh, go ahead, Lisa. Oh, I was just gonna say it's, it's just a form of, uh, you know, manifestation, which in, uh, magic terms, you know, uh, the will focused and put out into the world to create and affect actual change. So it's so fascinating. I've always been fascinated by books as well. Um, I guess it's not surprising I ended up being a, being a publisher and a writer. Um, but they have this power, like there's books that'll just change your life, you know? and they exist, once you have created it and it's no longer a part of you, kind of like a spell that you put out into the world, you have to have all your emotion in it, all your focus, all your vision. But once you put it out, 
you've got to stop thinking about it because yeah. it right. is its own thing now. It's its own okay. living. It's like a little golem you send out into the world. You know, mm -hmm. it's got its mission. It's going to do its thing. It's going to have right. relationships with other people that have nothing to do with you. You know, and, like, and that I, I think that kind of loss of control is actually kind of a nice element of, of writing that they exist. You, they come into these encounters that you couldn't have anticipated. Uh, and in the same way that books that you read, many of the books I've read, I don't, I've only accidentally ended up reading that book. It happened to be at the particular place I was staying there, or, you know, it happened to be up on the shelf at a friend's house or whatever. So I, I kind of like the idea of those kinds of accidents. So I think when I think of unread books and, uh, I think of those accidents mainly, and that uh, wanting to control to to be to the the book to be this sort of have this one to one correspondence with who you are and, and what you're trying to do. I, I sort of like seeding that and and not being responsible in quite that way and allow it those kind of encounters. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a healthy relationship to have. I think yeah. you know it can get very unhealthy if you tie yourself up too much. Mm -hmm. with your accomplishments it's good to be ambitious it's good to want more of yourself and of the world but you know if you get too tied up in your expectations then you're not going to notice actual opportunities when they come mm -hmm. and you're gonna you know you might get gifts and you're like oh whatever that's not what i wanted so you know i don't like it you know exactly yeah. letting your book live you know letting it breathe mm -hmm. and letting other people other people will then get what they get out of it you know exactly and, and the inspiration that, that they may have. And I think one of the most beautiful things about publishing books, which we're all involved in in some way or the other, is the person who's been inspired or gained confidence by seeing what you've written or your method or your structuring method that you had no intention of maybe as an author. Right. And yet you are helped. Someone else just randomly may get that. And you, don't, you may never even get a letter from that person or you may never even know that because of maybe the method mark you're using in your book, somebody says, I didn't know you could do that. I'm going right. to do it. And that generosity in writing, and that's the other side of publishing, I think, the, not just the ego fulfillment or getting, you know, what, whatever, but the, the, the generosity of sharing yeah. and inspiring in the way we've all been inspired by books that maybe we came across accidentally, that's someone right. gave to us as a gift, or that we stumbled on in a bookstore. And that person may never know how they helped and that cycle or that loop of creativity and inspiration and motivation, I think is right. the, other, the beautiful part of taking the risk of publishing a book and putting it out in the world right. um, and having it be out there for anyone to critique or to read. I think, and I, I think as you say critique that part of the generative value is that when I think about it, I don't even have to necessarily like a book to get a lot out of it, to, mm. to have learned something about avenues I don't want to go down or to have a thought like, you know how this could have been done even better or to greater effect. So a book, it's funny how something can play a, a productive role. Mm. And you aren't even necessarily, it's not necessarily something you file away in your memory as valuable or important, but nonetheless, had you not stumbled upon that, maybe the idea wouldn't have come to you in quite that way. So um, it, the, it, it's funny how the book can be valuable in these in these different kinds of ways, whether you're a fan or you're not a fan or uh, just running across certain things can can do that for you. So, yeah, I, I think that that absolutely is a, one of the big, big parts of the value of a book or even unpublished manuscripts that, you know, people that you send people or mm -hmm. that uh, things, previous projects you can look at later and, and get something from to develop or you can find things that you didn't at the time respect in its original formulation and maybe it makes its way into another book. Uh, so even you can benefit from a book that you've forgotten about to some extent, you know, in, you know. Yeah, I miss that. I miss walking around and stumbling <laughs> on a book. Yeah. Online shopping is not the same. Yeah, no, not, not anything what I'm saying right now doesn't at all make sense at this particular moment. <laughs> you don't have any accidents now. Pretty much everything you do is like planned and decided, you know. So. Well, <laughs> the happy accidents of the algorithm yeah yeah i guess so, I guess so. <laughs> um yeah actually i'm curious what is a book uh for each of you what is a book that you stumbled upon in when in when you were younger that really affected you in some way and where where did you find it what was the circumstances 
I, I'll start. Um, it made me think about, do I have it in here? Um, yes, I do. Um, so this is, this is one of my favorite books, Diary of a Drug Fiend by Aleister Crowley. Um, I found this, I was in college and I was hanging out in some guy's dorm room and uh, it was on the shelf and I borrowed it and I never gave it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it completely changed my life. It changed my life in the way that reading um, Camus changed my life in high school. Um, because I, I tried to read Sartre and I just found him super dry and convoluted and I had trouble following um, just like the philosophy books and reading The Stranger and A Happy Death by Camus, I felt like it was talking more the language that I understand, which is the mood of story and characters and emotions and all that stuff. So I got existentialism on like more of a, a gut level. Mm -hmm. And um, it kind of cleared up my thinking in general. It kind of cleared right. the weeds out so that I could start then growing and forming my own ideology. Um, but this kind of had the same impact with magic um, where, cause this is actually a work of fiction. I mean, technically it's actually, um, it's based on his drug addictions struggles with Coke and heroin. Um, but it's using the struggle with addiction as a parable about what you do with the magical will and how you can change even an addiction. So, you know, not recommended by doctors, you know, <laughs> magical will, you know, <laughs> methadone. Um, <laughs> but this book just really spoke to me and it was just his gorgeous, gorgeous language. So I wasn't even into magic. I wasn't thinking about any of that stuff. And this was like, this was definitely my gateway because it was explaining it to me in terms of a story. Like these characters are going through this, but then when they do this and they do that, mm -hmm. then they realize they actually have control over their will. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh wow, I actually have control, like even more control than I thought. So, you know, but I just found this and I stumbled along so many books right. at the college library there. I'd love to just wander around I remember I found uh, Eric Fromm's The Same Society. That was another fascinating book. And uh, it would take me down all these avenues. It was like walking in a forest, a forest of books, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. I love that. I, I, I think mine was a poem by Carolyn Forche called The Colonel, which is sort of well known maybe. I, I was into all sorts of you know, Ray Bradbury, Charles Bukowski, Flannery O'Connor, all through these phases. Um, and, but, but something about the Colonel, I was also in college and we read a poem and it's a block poem about her experiences meeting a, um, a, uh, Colonel. It's based on a real life experience she had in Guatemala in the seventies where she went down as a poet, but, uh, to, to investigate the death squads. Some of the death squad leaders mistakenly thought she was a CIA agent and invited her in to kind of to pick her brain and to think that they could make closer connections to the U.S. Uh, but she wasn't, she was a poet. And so this one meeting with the Colonel is a meeting with the Colonel and, and pouring the bag of ears from the, the people he had captured in death squads on the table. And it's just very, very beautiful, very short. And I think I could not figure out, and I still can't figure out how she packed so much meaning and so much feeling and so much history and politics into just a few lines. And that, and plus it was kind of fiction driven. I mean, it was a, a narrative poem. So it appealed to the part of me that loves fiction. And I think that that's a text I've been puzzling over ever since. Um, even when I teach it, I feel like I know it less. It opened up all my eyes to uh, our nation's involvement in South America, which I knew naively about, but I didn't really understand. It, it's led down to so many paths for me, uh, not only in terms of aesthetics, but politics. And I keep coming back to it feeling fresh every time that, you know, that I read it. So um, that's one that I would say I never outgrew my passion for that. Like I didn't right. I have a, like a Bukowski phase or something. Oh, right. You know, it's still Carolyn <laughs> Porche. I still... I go to that poem. I love that. 
That's yeah. so beautiful. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just say, I think in, in high school too, I, I, I honestly didn't read that much fiction in, in high school. One book I remember just reading for the curriculum and having very different expectations than what I got out of it was Walden. Um, mm. And I was thinking it was going to be this sort of very sort of pastoral, uh, idyllic kind of portrait being given about nature and I, I, something maybe more closely connected with, uh, I don't know, someone like Wordsworth or um, one of the English romantics. But what I found in it and what I, what I found valuable in it to me was actually how it had so much of it was uh, an excoriation of, of life as it was lived in his moment, right? About the phoniness of, of, of civilization in so many of its ways. So in, in some ways it had connections with um, Rousseau, I think, in that way. But I, I thought Walden is a book that inspired me then uh, in the sense of realizing that part of achieving that placid, placidity kind of is goes by, can be go through fury and rage and anger, which is something I did not expect to find. And even now I don't see the book, book sort of build as actually a very angry book, you know, someone who's scornful of many things, you know, and he, he dissects many habits of, you know, the people uh, in town, as it were, and in society and, and shows sort of the emptiness and the, 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 the vacuum uh, and something that he's, he's, he's struggled to reclaim some sense of meaning and grounding in life. So mm -hmm. I quite, I quite, uh, uh, my expectations were changed by that book. And, and similarly to Nick, I haven't, I don't think I've, I feel in any way I've outgrown mm -hmm. some of those sentiments about a vacuum mm -hmm. that, you know, <laughs> we're trying to fill somehow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sort of, sort of from the other end of the spectrum, I think my, um, my first memory of, of, an encounter with a powerful story is maybe Nick will know this one, but um, Paddle to the Sea mm. is, um, is a children's story um, about a native Canadian in Northern Ontario who uh, would like to uh, visit the sea. And so the child carves a canoe out of wood and puts some lead in, in the, um, in the keel of the canoe and, and then burns in the bottom of the canoe, please put me back in the water um, and sends the canoe on its journey um, toward the sea through the Great Lakes, um, all five of the Great Lakes. And um, this was the region that, that I grew up in and, uh, and Nick too, I guess. And, um, and to sort of see um, the geographic region that I was aware of being deeply connected to the geography to see it expressed from the point of view of, um, of a person who I was aware had been there before me mm. and had been there before the kind of person that I was. Mm. Um, and yet, and yet, saw the geography from a child's point of view in the same way that I imagined seeing it mm. um, from a child sort of relating to the geography of a region um, sort of preceding a political education of awareness of identity and right. capital systems and history and, and, and genocide and everything else. And, um, and I still think about the, the book is really beautifully done um, with maps and drawings sort of woven all through it. Um, and I think it was even, I think the, the, the child, the native Canadian child, I think was even, the story I think was even set in the late 60s or 70s. So it was, it was, contemporary with my own perspective on the region. And yet I felt like um, we were looking at each other across, mm. across time. Mm. And, um, and, and then in the same, in the same sort of train of um, uh, awareness of the elements sort of uh, from, from, the other, from the other perspective, um, I think my first encounter with those same sort of ideas uh, 
really as literature was with Jack London's To Build a Fire, um, which I don't know if you know it, but it's this really, really potent short story by Jack London in which um, uh, a prospector in the Yukon strays away from camp, tries to build a fire, it gets too cold, snow falls on the fire, puts out the fire, his fingers freeze, he's realized that his fingers were burning from trying to start the fire, but he couldn't feel his fingers, so they're on fire and he doesn't even know it, and then he dies. <laughs> and that's the, the, it's just a brutal, brutal story just in, um, just in the span of a few pages where you get sort of a, a whole, uh, a, a whole, a whole world of um, alienation and, uh, and encroachment and um, cost um, and the dire psychology of, of, sur of survival, you know, in just a few pages. And uh, really, really, uh, really potent stuff. Nice, nice. Um, so I think I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, mm -hmm. We're at an hour and a half almost. So very nice chunk of discussions. Um, uh, I would like each of you to just, uh, you know, let people know where they could follow you online and or your website, what, if you have any books coming out or anything like that. Only unread books. Drum <laughs> 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 roll. Well, thank you, Lisa. Thank you. This has been so cool. It's been really know. nice. Yeah. This is really fun. Just nerding it's, it's, out with a bunch of nerds. It's like seriously. Oh, heaven. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about you? Where can people follow you? Me? Yeah. Oh, uh, just uh, I'm on Twitter. That's there's, that's like my home base, you know. Just yeah. Nicholas Rombies. You Google it and you find it there. And um, yeah, I'm more working on things too. So we're all, you know. Um, but yeah, so that 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 that'd be good. I'd love anyone who is here. I would love to be in conversation with 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 anyone. I, I, I a few of you showed up in comments here, which is really nice. And but I just um, I feel like we're a little community here. So. Mm -hmm. I love that. I'll yeah. definitely be following you now. So you better be interesting. Okay. <laughs> my, I'll put on my interesting persona. Get your, get your hot takes ready. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, Mark, uh, why don't you... Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter as well at uh, Mark DeSilva1. Uh, and my book uh, that's coming, I have two, two books, I guess, coming this year. One, the... Uh, I think in summer, there's going to be an English edition of Square Wave um, by Splice. Uh, so that'll be kind of cool to have one out. I guess the original was about five years ago. So um, that'll be fun. I might do a couple interviews and things like that for that. And then the, the, the new thing is, of course, with you guys. So uh, at the end of the year, I have a, a novel called The Logos coming out, which is about, I don't know, seven or eight years in the making. So um, that's pretty much where all my energy has gone besides the current book uh, that we talked about today. So I'm very excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. We're very excited to publish it. We're trying to get it down to a manageable size. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest book we'll ever do probably ever. <laughs> um, well, thank you guys. And thank you everybody who came. Um, you, I didn't see your faces, but I saw your comments and your presence. We really appreciate it. It's so fun to have a, just get to talk about this stuff, you know, in a public forum. And I'm honored to host it with Clash. And, uh, you know, let's, let's do this again sometime. Thanks. Thanks.